So welcome back to another episode of A Fresh Perspective with Jeff Charles. And I've got another great conversation for you guys. This is a little bit, not too much out of my wheelhouse, but I don't think I've really discussed issues like this before. So um, I have a gaggle of great guests that you're going to like. Did you like that alliteration? I know you did. But before we get into everything, make sure that you like this video, share this video, and you got to subscribe. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that notification bell. That way you will be updated whenever I upload a new interview, which I do every Wednesday and Friday evening at 7 o'clock Eastern Time. Also, check out my brand new Substack, The Smattering. If you like my satire on Twitter, if you like my breaking news, now you can read the, the full-length articles on my website. So go, just go to the Smattering News dot com and become a subscriber preferably a paid subscriber but anyway without further ado i am bringing on with me the crew from redo voting and we are going to talk about some ways to improve election integrity which has been an issue for over the past few years uh welcome to the program uh lady and gentlemen thank you <laughs> thanks Jeff. All right. Now, before we get into the, uh, everything, I'm going to have you guys all introduce yourselves. Uh, ladies first, Ms. Clement Clemente. I'm Megan Clemente. I'm the director of Redo Voting. Excuse me, director of communications <laughs> of Redo Voting. I just gave myself a raise. What do you guys think about that? Um, <laughs> sounds like you're in charge. It's your call. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> all right. What about you, Brian? Uh, Brian Orvitz, uh, I drew the short straw and the CEO and CTO of Redo Voting at the moment. <laughs> Apparently, Meg has taken over, though. Yeah, yeah, well, you're CEO for right now. That's right. You're, like, you're the interim CEO, I guess. <laughs> and uh, Mr. John Rogers. Um, I am uh, John Rogers, and I am the duly elected president of Redo Voting. All <laughs> right, great. So uh, let's go ahead and get into this. Uh, what is Redo Voting? Okay, well, let me, let me just summarize it for you. Redo voting system combines unfakeable, user-unique access with unbreakable transaction encryption, resulting in universally accessible, completely secure elections, featuring a 100% guaranteed chain of custody for every vote from registration through election results and mathematically provable accuracy. Okay. Um, what? Oh, oh, go ahead. That's a lot to digest. Lot I know. To, it is. And yes. And I am, I'm, I'm going to have you guys break that down. But I wanted to find out first. I want to know the why. Uh, wh why did you, why, why are you guys um, engaging in this initiative? Okay. Well, uh, I think Brian and I can probably tag team on that a little bit. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, Brian and I uh, got together with the idea of starting a consulting firm. And so we put together some governance models and some decision making, some decision making matrices and started swirling around for something that we could uh, work on, looking for problems. Mm -hmm. And we kept coming back over and over again to the strife that was being generated by the elections that were going on at the time. So this got started back in 2020. And um, we decided we'd try to do something about it. And, and the big push at the time was telephone-based applications where you could vote from your phone. And so we started working along those lines. Uh, unfortunately, we reached a point in our development where we had a really strong user interface. We had a viable product that we might have been able to use, but we came to the conclusion that because telephone applications come through application vendors like Google or Apple, no telephone application is ever going to be trustworthy or secure because they can always get into it. And the very best we could possibly hope for was to stay one or two steps ahead of the bandits from now on. So we wound up going back to the drawing board. We said, okay, we, we, we have figured out how to make a voting system. So let's, let's break it down. Instead of trying to take something that is fundamentally insecure and untrustworthy and make it secure and trustworthy, let's start with something that is fundamentally secure and trustworthy and see if we can teach it how to vote. And the result was redo voting. So let me ask you this. I mean, because you mentioned doing it from your phone on, on an app. And I, I'm, I think I'm like a lot of people. I think that eventually it's going to get there, right? Like at some point in the future, I maybe not even in our lifetime, but it's, it's going to happen. But a lot of us are concerned about security because you're like you said, people can get into those apps. I mean, you, you know, I mean, you, we've got state governments banning TikTok over concerns about China. So how so actually first, 
can you kind of describe what the redo voting process is from start to finish? And then kind of go into a little bit about how that would make for more security, to, at least enough security to, to make people comfortable doing it. Oh, well, certainly. We can absolutely address that. Um, let's, let's start with, uh, with, with the original idea. Imagine a system that was as familiar to everybody out there as a scratch off lottery ticket. Everybody knows how to use that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, as secure as a scratch off lottery ticket. Now think about this for a minute. The lottery is in 45 states and five territories. Billions of dollars pass through this system every week. And in the 30 years it's been implemented in the United States, it has never been hacked. Mm. So what we did was we took the same technology and applied it to individual access to the system. We paired that with high-level encryption, one-way secure hash algorithm to protect each individual transaction. So the key to the security in this system is not that the system itself is secure because the system has to be completely open to make sure that people can get into it and see everything that's going on. But each individual transaction that is made comes from a secure one-way hash that cannot be broken. Okay. So every vote is secure, but the election itself can be observed by everybody. So when you say one-way encryption hash, can you explain what that is in English? <laughs> and I'm going to defer to my technical expert, our CEO. <laughs> All right, because because I, I, I'm a reasonably smart guy, but I ain't that smart. <laughs> <laughs> so a one-way hash is, okay, most people are familiar with the term cryptography, crypto. We're swaying away from that, kind of, but... Just in the way that people understand, one, cryptography, you can't really crack that because you're hiding data inside of a picture. Crypto itself, as people understand it, they think blockchain. So that's just a bunch of math that is stacked up on top of itself that if you change one digit, none of it works. So with what we're doing, we're taking QR codes that have never been, they've, one, they've been serialized off a printer, but two, there's 17 layers of latex and cryptography built in, and that's got math inside of it. That math works with you because you become a piece of math in the system. Once you put your information in, that math comes together and we just build upon it all the way down the chain of how the system works, which is it starts up, it sets the equation up when somebody goes into wherever they pick up their ballot, which could be a government office, a retail location, wherever. Um, and then that person, as long as they've got a scanner and a device, they can, they'll can they scratch that barcode that's in the ballot, and we'll cover this a little bit later, but okay. that starts it. You put your information in, you confirm it, and now the math is in your favor. Only you know the numbers. So, Gotcha. So for people who are more laymen um, mm -hmm. that would be concerned about this, especially, and I'll just say, especially conservatives, right? Because mm -hmm. we're, we're leery of everything, right? Mm -hmm. How do you think you'll be able to persuade them to be confident in, in such a system? Simplicity. I think the big thing, yeah, it's simple. And the fact that we use open source code, we're completely transparent. We give you the opportunity to watch it happen. So if the chain is disrupted, we know in that moment of time that there's a problem. And instead of waiting post-election to say, this wasn't quite right, how do we fix this? In that moment, it is auditable. It is real time. We can change it right then and figure out what is happening. And it, we can't do it in secret because it's open source code that mm -hmm. everybody sees it happening. I think the transparency and the fact that it is very simple to use gives people the comfort of saying, yes, I can do this. And I think I believe in the system. Like if I can see it happening, then I trust it a whole lot more. And right now the trust has been broken. So it's time for us to really try something new and see if this is somewhere that people are ready to go. While so many people want to go back to paper, I agree, like it would be amazing to go back to paper, but we're a digital age. How do we go back to paper when we have people, Americans that are voting all around the world? It's just taking forever. We're not following our own constitution of getting the results in in a timely manner. And the longer we take, the more opportunity there is for doubt, the more dis disenfranchised people get. And then mm -hmm. even when the results are potentially accurate, no one believes it. 
So where do we go from there? We have to really change things up. And that transparency effort, I think, is going to be the big win. Whatever system we go with, if you don't go with redo voting, that's fine. Find us a transparent system. Mm -hmm. that is going to do what we do. We clean the voter rolls. We are accessible to all eligible voters. We make it simple. You can vote in real time and we're not forcing you to vote in person, nor are we forcing you to vote at home. We are a hybrid system that can be used anytime. Yeah. You know, I think when you use the word transparency, you hit on the, the, the crux of the matter right there. I think if you, if that's, is what's communicated people will be more amenable to it because the biggest problem is that we don't know what's happening. Like in 2020, right. they were saying, oh, they were taking those suitcases out from other thing. Well, th that may have been completely innocent or it could have been insidious. We'll never know, right? Correct. So, I mean, so it, it, when things are more transparent, it does make it easier for people to feel comfortable. Now, and, I, and the reason why I think that it's going to go to something like this anyway is because you're right. I mean, we're, we can't expect to use paper ballots forever. I mean, we're not going to go back to using the horse and buggy. We've got cars now, right? I mean, there there have been advances in, in civilization. So can you, let, let's say it's 2024 right now, which I would love because in, as a commentator, I can skip all the nastiness that's going to be going on. But let's let's get in the time machine, fast forward to 2024, and I know who I want to vote for for president. How do I cast my vote with your system? Okay, let me let me talk you through that one because sure. uh, Brian is a technical guy. I'm a layman, and I'm delighted to see that Megan has a visual aid, mm -hmm. so we can we can talk straight with the visual aid. Um, this is what the ballot is going to look like. Um, if you look down the bottom left hand corner, you will see a rectangular square, mm -hmm. and then up at the top across uh, across the board, you see four square squares, right? Process starts like this. First of all, the ballots are printed up and they are distributed through any system that the state wants to distribute them. You can, the only thing that's required is you've got to have um, infrastructure that allows you to scan a barcode. So you can distribute it through a library, through government offices, through gas stations. It doesn't really matter because until that ballot has been activated, it has no intrinsic value. It's not actually linked to anything. Okay. But let's, uh, for the sake of example, let's go with a gas station, like a QT. Okay. So election time comes a few weeks ahead of time, depending on what the state wants to do. The gas stations or whoever's going to be doing the distribution has their stack of ballots delivered. Guy comes in, he wants to get his ballot. So he walks up the counter and says, hi, uh, can I get my ballot? He says, no problem. Let me see your ID. Normally that's going to be a driver's license or mm -hmm. a state issued ID, but it doesn't have to be. All it has okay. to be is in accordance with the state laws. So you get the ID. It's, it's the same as buying cigarettes or alcohol. So most people are, who are going in there are going to have that. Of we're course. Going to, we're going to successful. So he scans the, uh, scratches off the, the little square, the bottom left-hand corner of the thing, and he scans it. Then he takes your driver's license, and he scans the barcode on the back of that. What that does is it links that particular ballot to that particular voter in the database because it's tied in with the, with the state identification database. So that ballot cannot be used by anybody except that voter, period. Okay. Other security pieces can be, can be layered on top of it, but they're really not necessary. It's possible to add, for instance, say a four digit code, but you don't have to do that. The system itself is, is, is secure in that way. So that's the first step. He picks up the ballot, he's good to go. So he goes home and all you need for the next step is an internet capable camera enabled device. That's it. It, yeah. it can be a, like a phone, basically. A phone, it yep. can be a tablet, yeah. it can be a desktop computer, it can be a laptop computer. It really doesn't matter. So you sit down, you take the ballot and you scratch off the first square on the top left hand corner. Okay. That reveals a QR code. This is where we get into exclusive access. The 17 layers of latex over the top of that thing printed in a top secret, not top secret, but a top security facility. No one has ever seen that QR code except the guy who's using it right there. Okay. So when he scans that QR code, because it's already been linked to that ballot through his ID, it takes him straight to the .gov registration page where his registration is. Okay. 
So it goes straight to his registration. He checks the registration, makes sure that the address is current and everything else is right. When he does that, he hits the submit button. When he hits the submit button, the browser clears. There is no okay. remaining information on the browser. That information is put into a one-way secure hash. Now, what a one-way secure hash is, is it takes information of variable length, encodes it, and makes it a uniform length. So that identity goes out as a string of apparently unrelated uh, figures. So sure. nobody can figure out what it is except for the hash itself. Now, the other three squares on that ballot are also linked to this hash. So any other action that takes place with this ballot can find that hash without revealing the identity of the voter. So it's completely anonymous once you get it out there. Okay. Now, the one-way hash piece is important because there is also such a thing as a two-way hash. A two-way hash represents an exchange of information. Right. And in order to use that exchange of information, you have to have a password to be able to access it either end. So the way you break a two-way hash is you develop what's called a rainbow table. And a rainbow table pulls all your personal information and goes through every possible combination they can think of to break that password. Because there is no password involved, the only way to break a one-way secure hash is something called a collision. A collision is akin to having 100 guys standing down at one end with rifles of a football field. At the other end, you have one guy with a rifle. The guys at the far end don't know when he's going to fire, when the guy at the other end is going to fire the rifle or what direction. But what they're going to try to do is they're going to try to shoot that bullet out of the air after he fires it. Mm, okay. So the chances of actually breaking in that thing are absolutely astronomical. Frankly, anything. Yeah. You make that a lot more entertaining than talking about algorithms, John. I got to tell you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, when you can use men with guns to uh, describe an algorithm, I mean, <laughs> right. we have two veterans. Of course, they're going to use a gun. Well, I was a veteran. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> sign me up. <laughs> so, that information goes out there as a hash. So you're registered and 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 you're good to go for that election. The other thing is with that registration, um, the voter rolls are vetted every single election because unless you register with and get yourself paired to a ballot, you're not eligible to vote in that election. Mm. The only people who are going to vote are going to be on the voter rolls. So you're all registered. You're good to go. You wait until election day. You scratch off the second QR code and you show it to the camera on whatever device you wind up using. Because okay. your hash is already out there that has defined where you're allowed to vote and for what. So, so you've already, so just to make sure, you've already voted in that first square on the top there no not yet okay so that's just where you yeah. send your we, information all you have done confirmed is registration confirmed that your registration okay. is correct gotcha. and all we're you providing know. the added service of i don't know if you caught the subtlety but we're cleaning the voting the voter rolls yeah i got it. that so yes. dead people can stop it yeah okay. so on election day you scan that second qr code and that second qr code goes out and finds that first hash and assembles the ballot for you, the ones mm -hmm. that you are allowed to vote in. So everybody's ballot is going to be individually tailored to their specific registration. Nobody votes in the wrong election. Nobody votes in the wrong jurisdiction. Everybody votes in exactly the races they're allowed to vote for based on the registration. Okay. You go through, you make your choices, and you hit submit. Now that encrypted ballot is re-encrypted and goes forward again. Only this time, your ballot goes directly into a state control repository. Okay. Now this repository um, takes the form of a folder that anybody that the state wants to give access to can watch as stuff comes in. They can give it to law enforcement agencies, party officials, press, or even every voter on the rolls. Everybody who's registered, it can be completely open source. They can give access to foreign countries if they want to. It doesn't matter. Because all you're watching is to see that votes come in and none go out. Right, right. So when the polls close, the Secretary of State's office does the certifications to make sure that nothing hinky happened. And every single transaction revets the entire system. 
So if something did happen, we'd know immediately. We'd be able to put a stop to it. Once they've done their certifications, everything went the way it was supposed to, the Secretary of State publishes a decryption key that only he has. When he publishes that decryption key, anybody can run their, trans, their, their, their tabulation programs and everybody will come up with exactly the same count on every single race. Within hours of the polls closing. Oh, okay. It cannot be contested. Military votes, absentee votes, they're all counted all at the same time. Because really? this is done on, on a camera-enabled internet browser, you can vote from anywhere that you have internet access. Right, you can vote exactly. Real time from the space station. Mm -hmm. And it gets in there on time and is counted with everybody else. So there's no lag. But here's it's where it's also. Oh. I'm sorry. Almost done. <laughs> here's where it gets. You go first. Let's go to the third QR code. Remember that the identity of every voter has been completely uh, made anonymous because of the secure hash. But this third QR code gives that voter exclusive access to a downloadable PDF of their ballot. It's not identifiable as them in any way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. But they can look and see who they voted for and make sure everything went through the way it was supposed to. Okay. In the event, the state decides they want to have a hand recount, which is kind of like checking a calculator by counting on your fingers. <laughs> but if they decide they want to do this, all they have to do is send all of those PDFs to a centrally located printer guarded by a state trooper, and nobody can screw with a recount. Hmm, okay. So all of this is completely mathematically provable, absolutely transparent, auditable in real time, and removes the potential for election fraud. So let me ask you this, because this is probably a question that would come up. I'm just trying to anticipate what people would think of to, to ask about this. So when you cast your vote, that goes to the Secretary of State. They have their own code that only they have. So what is to keep, you know, people at the Secretary of State's office from trying to skew the results or, you know, trying to do some funny business? Well, because it's completely transparent, everybody would see it happen. Mm. <laughs> and yeah, that's true. And from well, the standpoint to, to chat, keep bear in mind that the system itself is hosted on a .gov server. So the, the, the number of people who could actually screw with it are limited to government employees of that particular department. Right, right. So the vote would have to come in to know that they would want to screw with it. So yep. they would come in and then we'd see because the chain would change and we'd see that it changed. Mm -hmm. And there's only a handful of people that could be responsible, which would highlight that handful of people as guilty. Yep. You know, and I, I would imagine with the, oh, go ahead. If you want to go to jail, take a shot. Uh, yeah, why not? The one thing I wanted I wanted to say before in uh, relation to what John was saying is this gives us the potential to have election day voting. Absolutely. So when we have the most amount of issues, it's when we keep elongating the election process because people can see results and if they don't like it, they have days or weeks to start making plans to potentially change it. So for any conspiracy theories out there, for anyone that is not a conspiracy theorist, but have been proved to be correct, we are getting rid of that opportunity. Now, again, if a state wants to do that, we have to go by the state rules. But what sure. we're saying is we have given you the option to have election day results, because when someone votes, it's immediate. And using the state gov, uh, gov servers, it's able to handle that amount of voters sending their information one way without crashing. And it makes no difference. I mean, 24 hours, 48 hours, three months, the process is exactly the same. They stay encrypted until the, the decryption key is applied. So if they want to stretch out voting, okay. Doesn't affect the integrity of the system. Right, right. exactly. It still works the same way, basically. And once That's someone right. is voted on a registration, that registration is canceled for that election. It can't be used again. So let me ask you this. So I went to one side, the conservative side, concerned about voter fraud. On the other side, they talk about what? Voter suppression, because apparently black people don't know how to vote. But but here's my thing. I, I could see the system also eliminating that as well. But what they will bring up is that what about people who don't have smartphones with cameras on them? We hope they do. <laughs> <laughs> So in, in short, you're, Jeff, you're hitting the crux of where, where we got into this because 
uh, we are predominantly military, uh, who our votes always get lost. So we we wanted accessibility was kind of our core issue. So we set about figuring out how to do this to make sure the military votes get get counted on election day. But it's just a simple step to the right to say, wow, what about people in senior living facilities in poor neighborhoods right. where they don't have access to devices? The reality is that's simple, that because the distribution system for this is already in place, wherever they deliver lottery stuff, you can hang the ballots on the wall like it's toilet paper. So anywhere that's got a $20 device, so their accessibility is, is a non-issue anymore. And I would think, you know, especially because I'm thinking about like older people, most of them have camera phones. But if you don't, I mean, they tend to have kids who can help them or bring you use their phone or whatever. So I don't think that that it would be a very viable argument. But, you know, you, I'm, you, you have to try to think of what what whatever will people say to to uh, to make it an issue. Um, how people can go to the library. People can do it at school, if they're utilizing their computers at work. That's if true. you have a computer, you're able to use it. If you have a friend with a phone, you're able to use your friend's phone. We're not limiting how many times a single device can actually vote because you would have to have that type of device if you're doing in-person voting anyway. But what we can see is how many times that device, uh, device voted. And we can um, make sure that your registration is connected to your ballot. So people can't just have ballots and just continuously vote in their room for a hundred people. They would need a hundred real IDs properly matched to registrations mm -hmm. to be able to do that. So it's still a one-to-one, -one, but the idea that no one has access to a computer at school, at work, at the library, or they don't have a device in somewhere in their circle of friends or anywhere, is really far-fetched in the year 2022. Yeah, and, and also, I mean, one of the arguments that comes up, I mean, everybody complains about this having to wait in long, like five hours, four yes. hours, two hours. I mean, even if you're in a, in a city where that does happen under this system, it's not going to take you that long to go to the library in comparison to standing in line for hours, you know, to vote. So it would actually eliminate that as well. Uh, when do you think, so are you... Are you guys trying to get this going for the upcoming presidential election or how? Okay. But that, that's where you're mainly focused. Ab absolutely. Uh, Jeff, it, Jeff it, can it, I interrupt for a moment? I, I actually have to step away. Okay. But uh, guys, continue on. Thank you very much. I would love to do this again. Good. Thanks for the explanation. You really you know, like, like laid it out in a way that, that a layman can understand. So I appreciate that. Good at Thank that. You very much. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, John. Bye. See you, John. Uh, but yeah, it's our, literally our first, our first issue was accessibility and so much. So we shot our first commercial infomercial, whatever you want to call it in a senior living facility, um, with a 92 year old woman telling her daughter how to do, how to vote. And, you know, like Megan said, in this day and age, there's no excuse. No sure. excuse. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, most people, they they have the devices or they can have access to the devices or they know somebody who has them. I mean, even if you're in an assisted living facility, maybe they can provide that for people there. I mean, there are this this does make it easier. Um, what kind of I mean, so because I imagine that you've already pitched a lot of this to secretaries of state and state governments. What kind of response are you getting? Amazing. Really? Amazing. Yeah. I mean, to the point where we have to have an actual professional like Megan with us to keep us on, <laughs> to make sure we don't say bad words a lot and behave like adults. That said, uh, we, yeah, we, ha we have the first world problem of, um, and I say problem, uh, being in the battleground states everybody's arguing over. Uh, the traction has been shocking. Uh, I, would, I would call the traction an entrepreneur's dream, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we, we are with the shot callers. So we're talking to the, the, the governors, the secretaries of state, the attorneys general, state reps, uh, election committees, we're, we're, we're ready to go. Wow. I think so it's important for us to add that we are a uh, nonpartisan company, sure. right? So while we seem to have the attention more from the conservative world, there is nothing that is conservative or liberal democratic that is about our company. We believe that election integrity is something that we should all be concerned mm -hmm. about because whoever the citizens want to be in power, yeah. that is the individual that should be in power, right? Yeah. So I think it's really important that 
you know, we're getting a lot of traction. It's been fantastic. Unfortunately, it's been a little bit more one sided. And we're really hoping that people go back and say, hey, remember in 2016, when this was an issue for the Democratic Party? And remember when Bush ran against Al Gore, and this was an issue mm -hmm. of the Democratic Party? Yep. We don't want people to say this is Trump, this is MAGA, this is conservative only. This is America. And this is currently an American voting issue. And mm -hmm. so we're hoping that with this traction, and we're seeing this success, that there'll be more open mindedness from other governors as well. Yeah. You know, it, oh, good. No, please go ahead. I was going to say, that's why I actually brought up voter suppression. I tend to make fun of it because I think that they exaggerate it. But there have been cases where they, they make some good points. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine yes. on that yes. side, like if you said, hey, you guys are worried about voter suppression, I could see how this system would pretty much eliminate that. It's going to be hard to suppress someone's vote if they don't have to wait in line, if they don't have to worry about having tons of paperwork, if they don't have to worry about, you know, the voter rolls being clear. And like, I can see how the, the, how both sides would be able to hey, hey, sign hey. on to this. And hey, here's the thing: we 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 really haven't you know beat it to death on this conversation, but this is open source software. So once we put it out there and we put it up on GitHub, you can't shut it off. That's it's Pandora's box because anybody mm -hmm. that's got a connection can vote. So if you're in a, in fact, talking about traction, we've already been invited to Mauritania, Algin, Algeria, Guinea, Nigeria. Oh wow! Yeah, and so and again, it's open source software. It's transparent. So there are no secrets and it. The, the, the biggest, I say this with a smile, the biggest downside is the terror that it is put into some politicians uh, because this is transparency. You got it. Careful what you ask for. Now you got it. Um, it, it, the people, the people love it. Politicians, we've been told by an elected official, elected official. And I quote, because he said it to myself, John, another one of our partners, he said the following, guys, it's not enough to be right. You're effing with the keys to power. This is Sauron's eye. You don't want to do this. Mm. And uh, so it's scaring some politicians. I can imagine. I can imagine, you know, especially in other countries. Well, when did you guys get started with this? So we we kind of, like John said, kicked it off about two two years ago prior That's to right. the last presidential election. And you know, I, I came out of Big Four Consulting um, and uh, the election happened. Our, we got mad because of military votes and then we pivoted. So we started working on the app, like he said. Then the IRS said they were going to come up with an app and all citizens have to have it. They loaded up with AI. So wait a minute, hold on a second. And nerd number two, my other partner, nerd, nerd two, and I kind of disappeared for a bit, took the app out of the equation because one, that takes it out of the app stores. Unless you get out of the app stores, you're still screwed by big tech. Yeah. So we can publicly host this. Not only can we publicly host it and take it out of control of big tech, uh, we put it in a fashion that everybody can have it whenever they want it, wherever they are. Uh, and so we just kind of ran with that because attraction was there. So let me ask you this. I mean, it sounds like you're making traction with, with some of these uh, states. And mm -hmm. I know 2024 is still a ways away. Have any actually committed yet or you got them almost there? <laughs> Oh, we, yeah, we are very, yes, <laughs> there's, okay. you know, when it comes to paperwork or signatures on it, what you can and can't say, but uh, we, if we, yes, we're facing roughly for 77 million voters right now, we could probably, we could take over by, here's, here's how fun this is. This is how easy it would be to implement. If a state has a lottery, if they want to use the system, to implement the system, all they have to do the next time they order their lottery supplies, just go ahead and order the ballots. Our ballots are coming off the same printers delivered by the same people mm. to the same locations. So we're there. And then- it's already got I the infrastructure. It's already there. The, the supply chain's already there. The knowledge on how to work it is already there. There's no change. Even for that store clerk, you come in with a ballot. He already knows how to do it. I just scan here. You're done. So there's no training. There's no education. It's kind of like going from a bank teller to an ATM. That's all it is. And it's just as simple and secure. Uh, so we send them a file that's an open source file and that's it. So we, yeah, set, um, off the off the jump, we could hit, and I'm being very, you know, very hopeful uh, saying 77 million voters. But point I'm making is we are in the battleground states. 
Good. I mean, and what'll be interesting, especially about those states, is that you know, if everything goes off with a hitch, which it sounds like it will, then that will that will keep the, the rest coming in. Mm -hmm. So this has been a very enlightening conversation. Like I I hadn't Honestly, I didn't even know that you guys existed before Megan reached out to me. And I think, <laughs> but, but, but I have been kind of paying attention. Like, you know, people, I, he, I see people on, on Twitter all the time talking about, we need to go back to paper ballots. I'm like, that ain't going to happen. I mean, not the way you're talking about. So this, right. I think that this could be a solution. So hopefully as time goes on, we can talk again about this and because I want to catch up and see how you guys are doing. Oh, but, wow. um, but before we sign off, why don't you guys let everybody know where they can find you? <laughs> Megan, you're better at this than I am. <laughs> well, of course, you can go to our website at redovoting.com. You can find us on Twitter. That's where we post most of our stuff, but also LinkedIn and on YouTube. We have a couple videos up there that really explain the technology and how the entire voting process can work. And you can always reach out to us as individuals, Megan Clementi, Brian Oravetz, and John Rogers. All of our emails are simply um, our first name at redovoting.com. And Jeff, if you do have more time, it's crazy to even think, but we actually have more features and benefits that we didn't even talk about, like 100% oh, really? chain of custody. So there are other things that we have done to really ensure we have checked all the boxes from anyone who worries about election mm -hmm. integrity in our process. And we've checked all of them off and some of them we didn't even discuss today. Ooh, okay, well, then I got to have you back on then soon. <laughs> we do. <laughs> all right. I got to tell you, when I first read your satire, I was like, this mother... <laughs> 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 that's so, a response I'm looking right for. <laughs> Selfishly out. speaking, I would love to come back because I, I mean, I, I've, I've started reading Smattering and I was like, this some, this dude's going to get his ass whooped by somebody because this is funny. <laughs> Eventually. Well, I mean, I, I'm in Texas, so I carry and I, I carry just for that reason, just because I know people will get mad at me for my satire. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, you, the one you did today with Griner, oh my God. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I might get in trouble for that one. We'll see. <laughs> well, I, I hope you do because that needs to be said, man, and the way you said it. So props to you. Thank you for doing that. Thank you. Thank you very much. But uh, we'll, we'll do this again soon. Thank, thank, thanks for coming on. Great. Thanks. Uh -huh.